Hello. Welcome to Lower Mass's Lair. I'm the happy salesman, bringing my cut around for another series of items with a storied history. Today, with our recent foray into the more royal places of the inner sea region, we shall be looking at some of the objects of a more royal persuasion. Now, of course, but a quick stop by the likes of Taldo and Kadira to see what secrets have been lost to time. So let's see what I have in my car today, shall we? First, let's look at one of the oldest places one looks at when they thought of luxury. Gold. This is, or was, the home of the golden carriage of Gaspar Longfellow. Once upon a time, long before the nation turned red, a Galton noble by the name of Gaspar Hawfast wished to show off his money and therefore create a gold carriage with which to travel across all of Galarian. His first stop was the River Kingdoms, where he was quickly separated from the carriage. Gaspar was rescued by a small band of adventurers and became one of their own, eventually becoming a wizard, to always consumed with one goal, to remake his prized carriage, which he did. A carriage large enough to hold six people, plus two drives and a footman because apparently they don't count as people. The place is protected from heat, cold, altitude, and uh, anyone trying to break down the doors. It also is pulled by four phantom steeds in the image of his favorite horses, lost to the bandits. Eventually, Gaspar and his allies returned to his home, where the carriage became a symbol of the nation itself. Until uh, centuries later, when the nation was torn apart by the Red Revolution, and the carriage, a sign of royal excess, was lost in the chaos. Speaking of lost signs of nobility, next up is the axe of the Dwarvish Lords. I know you're probably tired of hearing this by now, but the Dwarven Crest for Sky and a day's success. Yeah, mostly. The surface was kind of scary, what with the endless open sky and the strangest shaped creatures. Many dwarfs were ready to retreat back on the ground, considering this setting foot on the surface are well done. The king of the dwarfs, Ogik, called his people together, had all the clan leaders construct a single forge and use the metal from the homelands and from the surface to create a bell axe and use it to lead his people to their battle to find their way upon the surface. It is a symbol which unites all dwarfs and one which has the dwarfs scattered. Many wish to find and reclaim so their people can experience another golden age. This is a plus six keen throwing goblin bane dwarven war axe. With the addition of plus tender craft and the ability to summon North Elemental. With the single caveat that it is a Dwarven War Axe and non dwarfs lose for charisma when holding it. But do not worry. After 1d4 weeks, the wheeler is reincarnated into a dwarf. Funny how that works out. Moving on from frontline good kings. To a distant immoral queen, we peek into Irisen and look at the legendary dancing hut of Baba Yaga. This is a construct which is halfway between a chicken and a house. Don't have much history wise, but let's go through all the hut has to offer. First, it's a CR 17 creature which can more than defend itself, but it can also be controlled using a DC-30 magic device check and the controls of an egg and a cracked clay pot. Hold on to that image, it's just a taste of what the place has to offer. You see that Tut's main purpose is transport, and using the central cauldron and two of the ri random items inside the hut, one can travel to almost anywhere with the one that a majority of the universe 
is the depth of space, so random experimentation is not encouraged. The actual center room is a single room, but the configuration changes for each different location that the hut is in. All these places still actually exist, but just no dimension. Technically, Baba Yaga, someone as strong as her, can just walk from one of the metro spaces to another if they so choose. As for the places the hut can go, I'm not going to list all the places that she's set up, but for the sake of explanation, let me give you a few. To get to a territory in Eosin, two ingredients, a bone meal, and a snowflake. To get to the first world, it is flower petals and a love letter, sealed with a kiss. To the unescapable Cyrusel Gerardesca, it is husk blood and twisted iron. And for a trip to hell, a lizard's tongue and a rusty nail. Oh, what an all vacation home, a as long as you clean up after it. Next stop is the Verdura Forest. Look at Lost Stones. Lost Stones are records kept by druids in one magically accessible place. Using knowledge of nature, one can slowly decipher the various layers or markings along the stone's edges and even harmonize with the Lost Stone, gaining a druidic ability until someone else harmonizes the curse. The best way to explain this is to look at some law stones. We have three examples. First, the granite spear, currently held by the Pathfinders, marked with the sun, the moon, and the stars. This stone contains deep secrets, like the hidden tunnels beneath the forest, and the secrets of lycotropes and air shape changes along with the ability to cast Moonstruck if harmonized. The Gravetaker Sphere sits outside Rispel in the Vodoran Forest. I can't say it. Vodoran Forest. This wet stone feels uh, unpleasantly cold, it being one which contains secrets of death. From the nature of rot and decay to secret druidic burial grounds, Harmonization allows expeditious excavation. Or animate dead for those with a little more controlling of persuasions. Last example, the Prisne Stone in the River Kingdoms. It is wet even in the driest climates and gives knowledge of the biology of fish and ways to counter aquatic aberrations. With harmonization allowing one to detect Aberrations. It is unknown how many such stones actually exist, but they do well to keep the traditions of the Druids alive as civilization slowly draws near. Getting into treasures of talent proper, we have the Bell of Obedience. This is a relic of the Aslanti Empire, which the ancestors of the Talons brought with them when looking for new land. The Bell of Obedience is designed to affect the emotions of humanoids within 1,000 feet away. And if the person who rings the bell is good enough to add percussion, they might give those effects, those affected specific instructions. This has allowed the owner of the bell to keep their citizens in line. Until they learn they're being manipulated, then they tend to get... Uh, testy. The bell had, was recently lost during a riot at a prison in which, which it was being used at, with it most likely being taken by the Aspis Consortium. One last thing to note is that the emotional effects of the bell depend on the yoke it is hanging upon. If upon solid stone, it causes crushing despair. So the oak calms emotions. Iron hardens one's heart, ripping them into a violent rage. And bronze fills the citizens with the effects of good hope. So far, the materials have been untested. 
with the obvious hesitation of wanting to worry about the effects one brings about. But the reason we bring up Towering Guards today is not stones or bell, but the crowning achievement of Talno itself. The Primogen Crown. This crown was forged by the first Emperor Taldaris for the main, from the main of the legendary Grooksland, and has been passed down to every successive ruler of Taldor. Anyone who wears a crown gets plus five resistance bonus to all saving throws. However, if worn by the true ruler of Taldor, someone who has gone through the ancient coronation ceremony, it does much more. We are talking plus five AC, immunity to mind affecting spells, spell resistance plus eleven, the ability to speak and be heard by any all in a thousand feet, the constant effect of true seeing, plus four to intelligence, wisdom, charisma, knowledge history, and knowledge nobility, the ability to read and write both as Lanty and Celestial, the ability to call, cast banishment, control meta, and great spell magic once per day. The crown of Talda is definitely not just a decorative headpiece. Going a little farther south, from an object connected to the founding of Talda to an object dealing with the founding of Kadira, or more precisely, detailing. The deserts of that area are filled with a multitude of genies. There are many tales of mortals getting into deals of such, but one which stands out is a bragging duel between Mishan and the, the Jinns Esplata and Espelon. The two sides kept trying to one up each other, working to make the largest claim of their power, which eventually led to Mishan declaring he could write the entirety of his people's past and future onto a feather. And when the genie's call his bluff and told him to actually do it, despite it taking you know, multiple decades to do so, he succeeded. In congratulations, the twin genie granted the man two wishes. The first was to guarantee the feather would last forever, so his hard work would not go to waste. The second wish is unknown. Regardless, the end result is a feather covered in microtext, not only told the region's past, but protected the conquest of the Kelish and the many events since then. Today, it stands both as a national artifact of Kadira and a headache to Kelish, who would like the history to read that their takeover of the region had been peaceful. They worked to shout down unsubstantiated claims that their empire call it about and its past, calling all attempts to write the parts where they did wrong. Well, it's the 21st century. This is too topical for me to need to say anything. Support for Ukraine, by the by. Next, from the Solish Desert, we have the Garden of Solish. This is not actually garden, garden but a sigil. After all, Kadira is a place where genie biting is big. And sometimes, the usual seal is not enough. So a certain genie binder invented an upgraded seal, which extends the binding indefinitely, as long as the prisoner is continuously focused on one task. And for every year the task was unfinished, the binder would be granted one wish. So the Bayan of Sulesh kept his favorite merit bound, given the task of turning the entire desert into a garden. However, the side effect of Sigil is that it builds up stress, and after working on a task for so many years, the merit went berserk, destroying the garden and shifting the desert, stomping down the sand dunes, stopping the visits, and forcing the genie to start again. The sigil is still out there, bound to a lamp at the bottom of a well. The jinn 
continuous, continuing to try to change the face of the desert. One more genie related object while we are on the topic. The songs of Charja Thored. Charja Thored was a mirrored captured as a prize slave of, the, of an Efreet and taken to the city of Brass. He first would tell him stories every night. Of course, stories of the Ifrit's prize spread throughout the multiverse. There were thousands of people who watched every night, scrying on the stories, and many wrote down the stories as they were told. The most complete set of stories from, this cop from these copiers is the entire 50, including several favorites like The Binding of Rovergug. However, on some nights the mirrored told tales which sound like the lamentations for her homeland and how she used to protect it. In the hands of a good enough bard, this one-of-a-kind song can become the ballad of warding of the warding princess, a song that helps protect one's allies. An interesting find, but brings a question. This is the most complete of the set. With thousands of people watching, who knows what stories Ellis might have collected that the collector might have missed. Our final entry today takes us to a place we might be talking about in the not-too-distant future. Though we have already talked about the Hell Knights. So, the Ebon Thorn. This is a custom-ordered Hell Knight armor. A plus for boistering, grinding, adamantine full plate, which allows intimidation checks as a swift action when an enemy is poked, and can do it without penalty against a larger opponent. It was once owned by the leader of the Order of the Thorn, but the Cherish Civil War happened and the, and the Order was completely wiped out by the Order of the Pyre. The arm was hidden in the aftermath of the slaughter to keep the Thorn's enemies from getting their hands on it. And it is still lost to this day. Everyone, pro or anti Thune, are searching for this almost final resting place. After all, if it is found by the Dahl or Parisian nationalists or Andoran freedom fighters, this armor could spark what could start another civil war. Which, considering where Ch Chelyax currently stands, some do not quite see as a bad thing. And that's it for today's stock of relics and magical items. I hope I was able to find something you or your players will be attracted to. Can't wait till next time I come around to show another treasure trove of knowledge. And treasure. Until then, the lower master will be back as scheduled next week. I hope you all enjoy yourselves to then.